So myth number six, cooked foods are toxic. And this is something within the raw food community. They're partly right and they're partly wrong. Okay? Cooked foods are necessarily toxic. We can produce some toxins when we cook foods though. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> The reality is that certain methods of cooking are actually very safe. Uh, the safest methods of cooking are steaming and boiling when the broth is used. Because, of course, when you boil and you get rid of the water, you lose a lot of nutrients. Um, and so they do two things. They retain nutrients when you, when you steam or when you boil and you use the water. And they minimize the formation of harmful byproducts of cooking. And I'll tell you about those in a minute. Cooking actually can enhance the availability of certain nutrients from foods by reducing anti-nutrients, compounds that interfere with, a, with a mineral absorption, like trypsin inhibitors and, and hemagglutinins and, and even phytates and, and things like that. So, but there are problems with cooking. And I think that it's important for people to realize what happens to food when we cook it, to especially at high temperatures for long periods of time. And first of all, you can reduce nutrient and phytochemical content but significantly. You can damage nutrients by producing these byproducts of high temperature cooking. And of course, as I mentioned, the method and length of time makes a huge difference. So if we look at vitamin and mineral reductions, well with minerals, when food is boiled, you lose about 30 to 40% of the minerals. They're leached into the cooking water, the cooking water is discarded. Minerals are absolutely not destroyed by cooking. As a matter of fact, they're the only thing that remains when you burn a food to death. <laughs> That's your ash, is minerals, right? <clears throat> Vitamins are more prone to losses than are minerals. Commercial food processing results in losses of 50 to 80 percent. So this is really quite significant. If you take, for example, a, a, grain, a kernel of wheat and you turn it into white flour, you lose about 95% of the phytochemicals. Okay, so you're losing a lot of food processing. Losses can actually be similar when you cook foods for long periods of time or boil foods. And when foods are steamed or cooked briefly, losses are typically under 30%, which is a little more reasonable. Phytochemicals, generally with cooking, um, you get phytochemical reductions in, in foods. And most, some are losses in cooking water, some are just uh, losses from being exposed to air for long periods of time, temperatures, etc. Carotenoids are a little bit different. They're the main exception. They are generally more available from cooked foods than raw foods, unless you juice. If you juice, the carotenoids become very available because cell membranes are kept separate. And so that, that's where most of the anti-nutrients are located. So juicing is a good way for raw food folks to maximize absorption of antioxidants when they need an antioxidant boost. And uh, but when you cook a food that's rich in carotenoids like tomatoes, uh, the lycopene, you're, again you're breaking cells, the cell walls rupture and those compounds become much more uh, available and absorbable. So now I want to just mention the products of oxidation because I think this is just very interesting. There are several products of oxidation that are formed when you cook foods. Heterocyclic amines, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, advanced glycation end products, which are the end result of the Maillard reaction, okay? And acrylamide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these. First of all, heterocyclic amines. These are chemicals formed when meat, poultry, fish, and eggs are subjected to high temperature cooking. They're not found in plants because their formation involves the condensation of this thing called creatinine. It's found exclusively in muscle tissue with amino acids, which are the building blocks, of course, of protein. In 2005, HCAs were added to the National Institutes of Health list of cancer-causing agents. HCAs, or heterocyclic amines, increase our risk for colorectal, stomach, pancreatic, and breast cancers. So when we cook meat at high temperatures, especially with something like barbecuing in an open fire, uh, we dramatically increase heterocyclic amine content of the food. Now, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, these are chemicals formed by the incomplete burning of carbon-containing substances in foods or fats heated above 392 degrees Fahrenheit, as in deep fried. Okay? So PHAs are present in grilled or charred meat, poultry, fish. They're also formed on toasted grains 
and in anything that's fried in oil. PAH, PAHs are known as mutagens. They damage DNA, and they are linked to lung, skin, and genital urinary cancers. Advanced glycation end products, as I, as I mentioned, um, these are the irreversible final end products of the Maillard reaction. And the Maillard reaction, you may have heard of this, it is a form of non-enzymatic browning that occurs when sugars react with amino acids. And uh, the most concentrated sources of advanced glycation end products are grilled and fried meats. Although browning of foods can result, of any food, can result in this uh, AGE formation. And so what's the problem with advanced glycation end products? Well, they impair immune system function, they accelerate aging, uh, they contribute to the progression of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, kidney disease, eye diseases, nerve diseases, Alzheimer's disease. So they're involved in most of the major diseases that are killing us. Okay? And, and uh, in, in diabetics, we see huge, huge amounts of AGEs. And it's a huge problem. It's a huge, huge problem. So we want to minimize advanced glycation end products. And I'm sorry, this shouldn't say, well, my ear should say AGEs. Um, but the, the richest source that we know of is broiled frankfurters or broiled wieners, um, then boiled and then grilled or fried meat. Look at butter, even 4,000 in one tablespoon. Uh, even grilled or fried tofu, three to 4,000. Uh, and then the steamed meat, poultry or fish, you can see is lower snack foods like chips, granola bars, etc. And then you can see fruits and veggies very, very low. Are you saying the butter is natively like that or you have to fry it first? That is just native plain butter. And I, I actually am not sure why it's so high. But at least from the these these charts, the advanced plantation end charts or end products I believe came from the USDA uh, database. And uh, they didn't say fried butter, it just said butter. <clears throat> now acrylamide is again acrylamide is very, very interesting because this is something that is formed when starches are cooked for long periods of time at high temperatures. And anything above 248 degrees for long periods of time can cause the formation of acrylamide. It develops when the amino acid asparagine reacts with naturally occurring sugars like glucose. It occurs during the later stages of baking, when or roasting or frying, when you get that browning happening. And uh, the most concentrated fruit sources or food sources of acrylamide are potato chips and other fried salty snacks, French fries. Potatoes are, are so bad because they're so high in asparagine. So cooking, but your best way of doing potatoes would be to boil them or to steam them or something like that, as opposed to frying them or browning them in any way. Acrylamide was evaluated by the International Agency for Research on Cancer and classified as probably carcinogenic to humans. So this is one one shocker is right up here. You know that that you know that coffee substitute that everybody thinks is so wonderful. Um, the coffee substitute is made with blackened barley, and when you blacken barley, you produce a ton of acrylamide. Now that having been said, you don't put a hundred gram. This, these are all I think a hundred gram servings of these things. You don't eat a hundred gram of hundred grams of potion. You use a teaspoon. But still, it's interesting to note that they really are a very significant source of acrylamide. Then you've got sweet potato chips. Uh, you've got uh, potato chips. Look at this rye crisp bread. Everybody thinks the rye crisp bread, again, is like the healthiest cracker you can possibly eat because it's got you know, no added salt, no added sugar, and it's a fairly natural product. But it's baked for a long period of time, and so it does have a significant amount of acrylamide in it. I'll go back to that and just show you here. Uh, French fries, coffee is fairly high. Uh, nuts and nut butter is a little bit lower, but still significant. And you can see bread is fairly low, even if it's brown. It, bread doesn't have as much of the amino acid that causes the acrylamide uh, to form.